Hi, this is Orion, and you're listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories Podcast. Well, I have a number of short stories and fairy tales here. For the next little while, I'll be sharing a large chapter book with you. Illusion by Paula Volsky. For 200 years, the exalted classes have ruled over Vonar by virtue of their dazzling magical abilities. Now, their powers grown slack from disuse, they concentrate on the pleasures their station affords them, ignoring the misery of the lower classes. It is only when the red tide of revolution sweeps aside all distinctions of rank, home, and family that the exalted realize the gravity of their mistake. Thrust into the very center of the conflict is the beautiful Elise Faux de Raval, spirited daughter of a provincial landowner. Now, like those she disdained, she must scramble for bread in the teeming streets of the capital city, the key to her abilities and elusive secret, and find a way to survive in a world gone mad with liberty. Welcome again to Orion's Bedtime Stories. I am reading Illusion by Paula Volsky, and this is Chapter 3. Upon her return from Zen Subison's accidental execution, Elise sought her own chamber, there immuring herself in miserable solitude. And there she remained, ceaselessly pacing the floor, quick footsteps matching the tempo of her mental activity as the hot evening deepened to equally breathless night. The lamps and candles were all lit all over the house, and a veiled orange moon rose in the starless sky. Time passed. Her mind continued to race, and gradually her mood changed, initial despair giving way to gloomy conjecture, culminating in the startled realization that Dref Zenison's situation was not entirely hopeless. The power of the Marquis de Raval, far from absolute, might perhaps be circumvented. Dref might yet escape what amounted to destruction, provided he received assistance. It would not be easy, and she herself could not save him, but there was another who might, someone she would have to seek out this very night, as soon as she could safely get away. So Elise's thoughts ran as she paced her chamber alone. Only once was her solitude broken, when she permitted brief admittance to a servant bearing a a cold meal on a covered tray. Hours had passed since then, but the tray still sat untouched on the table where the servant had left it. Her mind filled with horrific visions of Drefsinison's impending mutilation. At least could not have eaten to save her life. Dref himself, on the other hand, locked up in the stables and unaware of the fate that awaited him, would probably welcome the nourishment. Assuming that he had gained consciousness, that he had regained consciousness. He was by this time probably both parched and ravenous. Elise paused in her pacing, walked to the table, and lifted the lid from the tray to discover a plate of cold meat, cheese, fruit, biscuit, and fresh butter. Alongside the plate stood a stoppered carafe of cold, mint-scented tea. Wine would have been better, but certainly Dref would appreciate anything he received. That he would receive it, She did not for a moment doubt, for she had laid her plans with care. Throughout the long hours she had plotted, and now at last, in the dead of night, while all the household slumbered, it was finally time to move. Breath now quickening, Elise hurried to the huge old clothes press, threw open the door, knelt to rummage within, and dragged forth a dusty valise. Thrusting her hand back into the press, she felt blindly about the floor and soon located a key. It was not easy to open the valise. The lock, untouched for the past four years or more, was stiff and a little rusty. Feverish determination prevailed, the key turned reluctantly, and the lid creaked back on its hoarse old hinges. Within the valise lay her secret processions the garments and all the rest of the hidden gear, just as she had left them 
so long ago, long unthought of, but but perfectly familiar. Last remnants of a hoydenish childhood whose recollection faintly embarrassed her. She had never thought to look on them again. Yet somehow she had never quite been able to throw them away, and there was no denying the thrill of illicit excitement that swept through her at sight of her former treasures. Old memories stirred, and the past was suddenly quite immediate. Elise gazed only a moment, then stood and began to pull off her clothes. The wilted voile dress went first, followed by layered petticoats, kid slippers, stockings, and garters. Off came rings and bracelet. The corset, with its tight lacing, presented certain difficulties. But eventually she freed herself, and her rib cage swelled in gratitude. Clad only in a short chemise of lawn, she stooped, grabbed garments from the valise, and with a speed born of much experience, donned bloused linen shirt, loose drawstring breeches, knitted socks, and flat, sturdy walking shoes, items unobtrusively purchased at fairs or from peddlers by the adventurous child she had once been. The shoes still fit, even after all this time. The tight, pointed little slippers she'd worn in recent years had apparently kept her feet from growing much. Elise took a few experimental steps, unconsciously smiling. She'd almost forgotten how comfortable such clothing could be. Her right hand dived, seemingly of its own volition, into her breeches pocket to bring forth a narrow grosgrain ribbon with which she bound her hair at the nape of her neck. At the bottom of the valise still lay the belted tunic, lined coat of masculine cut, gloves, hat, and boots. In view of the sultry weather, she needed none of them tonight. The lantern and the canvas satchel were essential, however. She scooped up both articles. After a moment's hesitation, she also grabbed the old clasp knife and dropped it into the satchel. Its blade was short and dull, but perhaps Dreff would find a use for it. Crossing to the table, Elise transferred the cold food from plate to napkin, tied the corners, and dropped the bundle into the satchel. Alongside the food, she placed the carafe of tea. She began to draw the bag shut, but stopped as another thought struck her. Money. Dreff would surely need money, and she had plenty. Her netted silk purse lay in the bureau's top drawer. Quickly, she fetched the purse, tossed it into the satchel, closed the bag, and slung its strap over her shoulder. The lantern sat on the table where she had left it. The candle inside was almost untouched. Using a taper from one of the wall sconces, she lit the lantern, replaced the taper, and then she was ready to go. passed from bedchamber to sitting room and then, almost to her own surprise, paused at the corridor door. She had forgotten that she'd always used to stop there to listen for the sound of footsteps in the hall, but it seemed that her feet remembered. There was no sound now. Softly, she eased the door open a trifle, applied her eye to the gap, saw nothing, opened further, stuck her head out, glanced swiftly left and right. The corridor was dark and deserted. Quietly, she slipped from her sitting room, closing the door behind her, and turned left to slink like a feral kitten down the hall as far as the steep and narrow servant's staircase, which she descended in expert silence. Halfway to the bottom, she hesitated a moment, then set her back to the wall and edged sideways down the next several steps. Once again, her feet had remembered This section of the staircase creaked. Moments later, she emerged into the kitchen, where a few banked embers glowing on the hearth added their heat to the already stifling atmosphere. A couple of scullery maids slumbered on their pallets in the corner near the open window. Perhaps the light of the lantern disturbed them, for one tossed and muttered restlessly in her sleep. Elise froze. 
Only when the maid had sunk back into quiescence did she resume her did she resume her careful progress. Through the mud closet she crept, out onto the landing for her first sweet breath of comparatively fresh night air. Her pulses leaped then, and the and all the old, nearly forgotten sense of forbidden delight came flooding back as she regarded the misted moon, the black sky, the dim expanse of empty lawn and garden. It was a good thing she had brought the lantern. She would need it tonight. Without troubling to use the steps, she sprang from the landing, came down lightly on the balls of her feet, and set off across the lawn at a trot. A slower pace would have conserved energy, but she had a considerable distance to travel and dangerously limited time. Through the gap in the hedge she passed, through the rose-perfumed flower garden, under the arbor, and into the fields. Just once she glanced southwest toward the stable where Andreff lay imprisoned, then firmly turned her eyes southeast toward the forested hills whose darkened bulk she could just barely distinguish by moonlight. It was a good 20 minutes trot across the fields to the stand of Deraval timber. Despite the long hiatus and nocturnal ramblings, Elise was scarcely breathing hard by the time she arrived. It would seem that her fondness for riding had kept her in reasonably good condition. Around her towered the tall, straight trunks. Above her spread a canopy of branches, their foliage masking the moon. The weak, jouncing light of her lantern provided the sole illumination. Nevertheless, she did not slacken her pace and soon emerged from the shadows to find herself on the shore of the fish pond, beyond which, the, beyond which stood the cottages of the serfs. Ordinarily, those halls were darkened from sundown to cockcrow. Now, rushlights burned in the windows of two of them. It was not difficult to guess whose. Skirting both pond and cottages, Elise trotted on. Soon the ground angled sharply upward, and the swift pace became a little difficult to maintain. She had reached the first of the hills, and she was back amidst the trees again, traveling a small but well-remembered path, now choked with brush and weed that braked her progress. When she came to a bend in the trail, where the big moss-covered rock had so often served as her bench, almost she haunted Almost she halted at the familiar resting place, but tonight resisted the impulse. On she climbed, the way much steeper now, and her trot slowed to a walk. Over the crest of the first sharp rise, pleasant relief on the downward slope, then up again along a stone-strewn dried watercourse as far as a small, flat clearing, where further progress was apparently blocked by a sheer cliff of naked, featureless rock that rose for a hundred feet or more. Apparently blocked, at least knew better. Confidently, she moved left along the base of the cliff until she came to a fungus-bracketed tree stump among the exposed roots of which lay a flat stone. Elise pushed the stone aside to reveal a small, tile-lined compartment housing a lever of bronze. She pulled the lever once, almost roughly, then back again, very gently, then twice more, back and forth, quickly. Replacing the stone, she settled herself on the ground to wait. She did not have to wait long. Not ten minutes had passed before a small area some fifteen feet up from the base of the cliff began to shimmer with faint phosphorescence that would have been invisible in daylight. Elise fixed her eyes on the spot, and as she watched, the glow sank slowly to ground level, and the rock itself appeared to simmer like lava. The simmer intensified to a boil, the glow increased, and a figure, and a figure appeared to step from the stone whereupon the ghostly light vanished. Rising, Elise greeted the apparition with a smile. Uncle Quince, she said. My dear little girl, his answering smile beamed genuine affection. It has been too long. 
He had materialized like a ghost or demon of the night, but it was impossible to imagine him inspiring fear. Quinn Svoderaval was slight of build, frail, and short, a little shorter than Elise herself. He had the pallid, bleached skin and the hugely protuberant, colorless eyes of the nocturnal creature that he was. In the low light of the single lantern, he looked pale and fragile as a moth. The monochromatic effect was enhanced by shapeless, loose-hanging garments of twilight gray, and by the nimbus of long, baby-fine, cloud-white hair floating about the narrow face. His brow was high, bulging, and almost unlined, nose long and drolly upturned, beardless chin fine-pointed and delicate, great eyes magnified by thick-lensed, wire-framed spectacles. His outsized ears stuck out sharply, protruding through the weightless mist of white hair, and he possessed the fascinating ability to wiggle either or both at will. His hands were deft and adroit, yet most of his gestures were tentative, even timid. His expression was mild, benign, often a little confused. His age was almost impossible to guess, but one thing was certain, he was older than he looked. Uncle Quinn's was in fact a younger brother of Elise's long-deceased paternal great-grandfather. Throwing both arms around her kinsman, Elise hugged and kissed him so fervently that Quince staggered beneath the onslaught. Regaining his balance, he returned the hug with a pleasured if bewildered air, then took her hand and began to lead her straight toward the cliff. Come, child, Quince invited. We shall go back to my cottage, where it is cool and pleasant. We shall drink sweet cider, chat to our heart's content, and perhaps you may persuade me to play a game of blue cat with you. Uncle Quince, I haven't played blue cat in years, Elise tossed her head. I'm not a child, you know. What, no more blue cat? A pity, it is one of my favorites. What about ring a greeby then? Ring a greeby is nearly as delightful as blue cat. Certainly not. Hide the owl? Blind boatman? Gavuzio? Uncle, I am 17 years old. That is gratifying, my dear, but what has it to do with Blue Cat? I can't play baby games anymore. I'm an adult now. You are? You are? Pausing at the very foot of the cliff, Uncle Quince surveyed her anxiously. When did that happen? You look much the same to me. That's only because I'm not wearing my good clothes. If you saw me in my aquamarine sarsenet, then you'd know I'm all grown up. And therefore you cannot play? <sighs> but how very sad. I am sorry. An alarming thought struck Uncle Quince. Does this mean that I, too, am barred from Blue Cat? I do not think that it is at all fair. No, no, Uncle. You may do as you please, of course. Oh, I am relieved. In that case, my dear, let us return, and you shall instruct me in the finer points of the game. To teach is not to play, and therefore you need not suffer the pangs of conscience. As he spoke, Uncle Quinns extended his left arm, which appeared to sink shoulder deep into the granite face of the cliff. Elise started a little. I'll never get used to that, no matter how often I see you do it. She pressed her own hand flat to the rock, felt the rough, unyielding, unyielding contours between, unyielding contours beneath her palm. I could swear it's real. It seems so solid. How do you make it feel so hard? Illusion, my child, pure illusion. Designed to protect my privacy. I'm glad my poor shadows entertain you. But come, close your eyes, and your Uncle Quince will lead you through safely. No, Uncle, not tonight. I didn't come for a visit. I'm here because I need your help. My dear little girl, you look quite unhappy. What can I do to restore your pretty smile? Uncle Quince, a friend of mine. No, not actually a proper friend, just one of the serfs. He's in trouble. More than trouble, real danger. Do you remember a serf named Drefzinosan? That clever, so talented lad? Yes, indeed. A remarkable boy, quite astonishing. 
is he is ill? Much, much worse. Oh, Uncle Dreff. Oh, Uncle, Dreff's gotten himself into such a mess. His life is over if you don't help him. I mean, truly over. He'll be destroyed forever. He hit my father. Oh, he must have been mad to do such a thing. He hit the seigneur, knocked him flat, and bloodied his nose. I thought my father would have Dreff whipped to death for that. He didn't, but only because he was able to think of something even worse. Dreff's to lose his, his tongue and his right hand. Quince's great eyes enlarged, and he made a brushing gesture, as if to repel a prospect too gruesome to contemplate. Surely not. Surely it cannot be. Was it not but an empty threat intended to teach the lad a lesson? No, it's real. It's to be done tomorrow morning. Father meant every word. It's unjust, horrible, and so dreadfully... She groped for the right word, but the one she settled upon was simple. Cruel. Oh, this makes me sad. Uncle Quince shook his head, white hair wafting. My nephew Hubert's son, that is to say your father, inherited his grandfather's callous heart. When he was a boy, deliberately breeding abnormal mice to produce a race of tiny two-headed monsters, I worried about him. I'd hoped that age might serve to mellow his nature, and yet, alas, Uncle Quince, I came here tonight hoping that you'd help Dreff escape. He's locked up in the stable now, with a huge hulk of a blacksmith guarding the door. Alone, there's nothing I can do for him. But you, with your magic, could surely find a way, if you will. Please, Uncle, say you will. Otherwise, tomorrow morning, Dreff's tongue and his hand, his right hand, will be... He'll be... She was trying hard to speak calmly, but she was losing the fight. Her throat had closed up like a dirt clogged, like a dirt clogged rain spout, and the words could barely emerge. Her face crumpled, her eyes burned, and the tears gushed forth. Oh, please don't cry, child, Uncle Quince begged. He patted her shoulder, stroked her hair clumsily, and fidgeted. Please don't. We'll help the boy, the two of us. He'll not be harmed, I promise. I'll deal with a blacksmith, and we'll have your young friend out of that stable this very night. Please believe that, my poor little dear, and don't be sad anymore, or I'll start crying too. The huge eyes behind the thick lenses were indeed starting to fill. Her muted sobs subsided to sniffles. She wiped her eyes on the sleeve of her shirt, swallowed hard, and managed to whisper, Thank you. Bless you, Uncle Quince. His face reddened, and he answered hastily, Pooh, child, no need to thank me before I've done anything. And if we're to do anything tonight, then we had best begin, had we not? It is a long walk to that stable, and I am no longer spry as I once was. Come, my dear, there is no time to lose. Let us be off. And try to smile, please do. All will be well, and we are having an adventure. There was only enough time to snatch up the lantern before he reclaimed her hand and hurried her off down the path. Couldn't you just use your magic to fly us there or something? Elise inquired as they stumbled down the steep, stony trail. How delightful that would be! But I am sorry to confess that your old uncle is not nearly so clever. I can but produce illusions, or sometimes, if it is there, detect and cultivate the buried consciousness in creatures and objects. But, child, no one can break the law of nature that prohibits man from flying. If it's a law, then what about those new balloons? Those what? Balloons, Uncle Quince. Big, brightly colored ones filled with hot air. If the balloon is big enough, it can lift a basket carrying people, and then it flies. You don't mean it. He stared at her, entranced. Now that is magical. I am overwhelmed. But how exciting, how wonderful, how truly extraordinary. My dear, it is hard to believe. Balloons? Are you sure? Yes, I've spoken to people who have seen them. Oh, how 
How I wish I could see one too. Brightly colored, you say? How lovely. What a glorious spectacle it must be. And to think I never knew. Alas, isolated as I am, I miss a great deal. Truly, the world has passed me by. Oh, uncle, if that's the way you feel, then why don't you come to visit us more often? Or better yet, why don't you come to Dar why don't you come down to Daravel and live with us? Everyone would love to have you there. Smiling, he shook his head. Dear little girl, I could not do that. How should I study? How should I practice my art at Daravel? The distractions would destroy my concentration. The noise, the bustle, the comings and goings. No, I could not work there. It is only in solitude, in a quiet, rustic retreat, alone and undisturbed, that I may hope to achieve the serenity that my work demands. I must be alone and at peace. It doesn't sound very lively. Aren't you lonely? Sometimes, he admitted. Sometimes. But it is the only way. Have you always lived like this? Oh, not always, child. A very long time ago, when I was a lad, I lived in the Daravel Manor, as you do now. There was companionship, affection, pleasure, and luxury. I still remember. But I discovered at an early age that I possessed certain mental abilities peculiar to some exalted. I discovered, too, that the development of those abilities meant more to me than anything else in the world. And I also learned that incessant practice, combined with a life of self-denial, are required to develop them. Therefore, when I was seven years old, I was sent to Bozenil Commune in the Ossidy, where a band of exalted masters had founded a, settle founded a settlement in the hills. There they had gathered to practice, to learn, and to pass on their knowledge to children of proven ability. It was not an easy life there, Uncle Gwynne's remembered. The work was demanding, and the masters, oh, some of them were quite terrifying. I had to sleep on the floor when I was used to a feather bed, and eat nothing but brown bread and vegetables when I longed for chicken and cream cakes. The dormitories were unheated, and there was no hot water. I had to rise at four in the morning, work in the kitchen or gardens until ten, eat, and then take lessons until supper time. In the evening, a couple of hours were set aside for study, and then it was bedtime. Anyone caught talking during study hours was locked in the woodshed all night long, and anyone caught with a light after curfew was whipped. It happened to me once when they found me reading in the privy at midnight, and once was enough to teach me my lesson. Master von Nilaist thrashed me so soundly I wasn't able to sit down for a week, and I never dared break those rules again. Uncle Quince, it sounds perfectly odious. Didn't you hate it there? Weren't you homesick? Very much so in the beginning. For the first four months, I cried myself to sleep every night. Oh, and you were so young. How could they treat little children that way? Why did the parents allow it? The parents had consented to grant the master's free hand. In any case, those harsh practices were designed to teach the discipline and self-denial essential to the art. Indeed, they were intentionally difficult lessons, meant to weed out all but the most dedicated of scholars, and in this they were effective. Fully a third of the students returned to their homes before the end of the first quarter. Well, I should think so. I would never have submitted to a beating. Never. I'd have burned the house down first. And if they tried to lock me up, I'd have run away. I thought of running away many times. Once I even went so far as to pack my belongings in a sack. But each time I was tempted, I thought of the art I was learning, the abilities I was developing, the illusions and sentient inanimates, and all the rest, all the knowledge that I'd be giving up if I fled that place. For mind you, there was nowhere else I could have learned so much. I'd think of that and the urge to run would fade away. In the end, I chose to stay. And do you know, once I'd really decided that, the harshness and privation somehow became much easier to bear. I stayed at Bozen Hill for 15 years. And never came home in all that time? Well, once a year for a two-week holiday, but after the first few years, I didn't enjoy the visits. 
I no longer had anything in common with parents or siblings who, for reasons I cannot fathom to this day, regarded me as an oddity. Conversation was difficult, and I could not feel that Derival was truly my home. It was always with mixed sadness and relief that I would return to the commune. And at the end of 15 years, Uncle Quince continued, I had learned everything the masters of Bosnil had to teach. At that point, I might have remained at the commune as a master myself, or I might have taken my place in the world as an exalted Vauderevel. Instead, I chose to renounce the society of men for the sake of my art. Perhaps it was a wickedly selfish act, but then again, perhaps not. There are so few these days willing to accept the restrictions that our discipline demands, so few left to guard and to build upon the old knowledge. I should like to believe that my discoveries possess value. In any event, wicked or no, I have never regretted my choice. Why, uncle, I think it was a noble choice, Elise told him. Do you truly, my dear? He seemed reassured. Of course, but how is it that you never told me this interesting story before, and you're telling me now? Oh, I see what you're up to. You're trying to keep my mind off my worries. Ah, clever child, you are far too sharp for your uncle. That will be the day. I'm glad you're contented, Uncle Quince. All the same, Elise decided. It doesn't sound like much fun to me, and I'm glad that I never had any magic. Actually, you cannot be certain you have none. It is present in our family, and you might, in fact, discover a certain hidden talent, should you ever care to search for it. Think, my dear, how like a treasure hunt. I would be happy to assist. Oh, no. No, thank you. I want none of it. I'm finished with lessons and study and all such dreary stuff. I want excitement. I want something new. I want some fun. Ah, to me, Blue Cat is fun. But what is fun for you? Shireen will be. I know it. I'm going next week, you remember. I'm to be a maid of honor to the queen. Think of it. Only another few days, and then I'll be at court. I have never seen the court, Uncle Quince observed mildly. What will you find there, my dear? Everything in the whole world, Uncle. There'll be famous people from the great families, music and dancing, plays and puppet shows, games and hunting, parties and picnics, suppers, masquerades, the most wonderful clothes and jewelry, no end of things to see and do. It's where everyone alive wants to be. Everyone? Well, everyone who can, of course. Everyone who wants to be at the center of things. What things? New things, exciting things, all the best in life. You make it sound very splendid, my dear. I hope it fulfills all your expectations, but I shall miss you. I'll miss you too, uncle. But don't be unhappy. It isn't as if I'm off to Bosnial Commune for 15 years. When the weather's good, Shireen is only six days from here by coach. I'll be back at, I'll be back to Derivel several times a year, and I'll visit you often. I must console myself with that then. In the meantime, my dear, you might tell me of your impending journey. Elise obliged, treating her kinsman to an exhaustive description of her plans, her hopes, her doubts, and the wardrobe she intended to carry to Shireen. The subject was absorbing, and she spoke at length, with enthusiasm, all fear for Drefzinus and momentarily dismissed from her mind. As far as Elise was concerned, Dref's escape was all but accomplished, his safety assured from the moment that Uncle Quince had agreed to help. Innocent and absent-minded though he seemed, Uncle Quince somehow managed to get things done, and his intervention was invariably effective. Never, throughout her entire life, had she known Quince Vauderaval to make a promise she to make a promise he couldn't keep, and he had promised now. Thus she was still burbling on about Shireen when they broke from the cover of the trees to emerge onto level ground, chattering still as they made their way around the fish pond and through the trees, and still as they struck off across the fields, heading west toward the vineyards and outbuildings. Uncle Quince listened with every appearance of wondering interest. It was not until they neared the carriage house, which, which lay behind, the behind which lay the stables, that he lifted a cautionary finger to his lips. 
Her conversation cut off at once. In silence, they edged along the south face of the building, pausing at the corner to peer wearily around the wall. The moon was now low in the sky, but the obscuring veils of mist had thinned. A stone's throw distant loomed the dark, rectangular mass of the stables. Borlo Bunnison sat there on the ground, back propped against the closed door, heavy staff lying across his knees, head sunk on his breast. He was asleep, his large body blocking the sole entrance. The blacksmith, Uncle Quince observed in the smallest of whispers, a healthy specimen, to be sure. What admirable muscular development. The brute's enormous. How shall we get past him? I shall cast a glamour. You must not be alarmed. Promise? Elise nodded, and Uncle Quince touched her cheek approvingly. My brave girl. Folding his arms, he bowed his head and stood motionless. Elise watched with curiosity. Uncle Quince's tricks were wonderfully entertaining. Which would it be this time? The singing cloud he'd done for her birthday last year? Fire flowers? The phantom giraffe? Interest sharpened to uneasiness as the seconds paused and he did not move. Usually the magic was prompt. Was Uncle Quince experiencing difficulty, perhaps even losing his knack just now when it was most needed? She was on the verge of asking when he began to speak, a low, muttering, repetitive chant, all of it gibberish as far as she could tell. His voice was peculiar, deeper and more more authoritative than she had ever heard it. His breathing was deep and controlled, his expression so remote, so uncharacteristic, that for a moment it almost seemed a stern-faced stranger standing there. Elise stared at him, perplexed, and as she stared, she thought that his aspect altered. Or perhaps it was the air about him that was changing, thickening and swirling, teasing her vision. Squinting, she rubbed her eyes, but her sight failed to clear. Or rather, her mind failed to clear, for she was vaguely aware that it was her perceptions and her understanding that Uncle Quinn's magic had truly mischieved. Her eyes were irrelevant. He had somehow infiltrated her consciousness. Love and trust him though she did, her instinct was to resist. Instinct not, instinct notwithstanding, she had no notion of mental self-defense. And even as she watched her kinsman, her familiar, his familiar short figure faded from view. Elise gasped and the lantern dropped from her hand. Her uncle was gone, and in his place stood a gigantic wolf, far larger, far larger than any natural wolf that had ever lived. The creature's luxuriant fur was twilight gray, the long guard hairs on ruff and chest tipped with white, muzzle and prick ears beautifully penciled with darker markings. The pale eyes were large and greenly phosphorescent. It's Uncle Quince. Elise inwardly insisted. She was breathing hard, heart sprinting, every muscle tensed and ready to un- ready to run. Only Uncle Quince. He told me not to be frightened, and I promised. Given a little time, she would have succeeded in calming herself. But there was no time. Far more alarming transformations were in progress. Elise felt herself changing. Her body bent, legs curving impossibly, arms lengthening, jaw expanding, teeth and fingernails thrusting. Her her insides convulsed momentarily. She sensed the painless distortion of bone, joints, and muscle. The shift of contour, expansion of ear and coccyx, wave-like spread of thick honey fur. And then her point of view dropped, and the ground was close. The claws of her four feet dug into the soil, and she felt the balanced weight of a long furry tail, the quiver of sensitive nostrils, the cooling play of air along the long, lolling tongue. 
Terrified, she felt her ears flatten, her lips wrinkle, and her back arch, hair bristling along the spine. Her cry of alarm was translated to a keening lupine whine. Calm yourself, my poor little girl. Somehow, Uncle Quince's voice issued from the gray wolf's mouth. There is nothing to fear, child. What has happened to me? She heard wolfish whimpers and her own voice simultaneously. The sound was bewildering as it was fearful, and her tail clamped down hard between her hind legs. Nothing, my dear. You are absolutely unchanged, and so am I. It is not real. It is so. Change me back. Child, there is nothing to change. Trust your uncle and do not fear illusions. Now, come, take up your lantern and let us proceed. His confidence quelled her rising panic. Without thought, she responded to the authority in his voice, automatically stretching forth her right front paw as if it were still a hand with which she might grasp the fallen lantern. Her confusion deepened as she felt her fingers close upon the cord-wrapped ring. At the moment of contact, she beheld a ghostly image of her own hand superimposed upon the wolf's paw. The image faded and only the paw remained. Thoroughly confounded, she extended her muzzle to take the ring in her mouth. A series of muffled yelps escaped the gray wolf. Forgive my laughter, child, but you are a rather comical sight, said Uncle Quince. Wouldn't you prefer to carry the lantern in your hand, my dear? Her muzzle heated, and she knew she must be blushing. Hastily, she transferred the burden back to her right front paw. There, that is better, is it not? Now come, follow me, do exactly as I do, and we shall soon be rid of the blacksmith fellow. Is it not thrilling? What an exciting excursion this is! Lips spread and tongue protruding slightly in the lupine equivalent of a smile, Uncle Quinn's loped off across the stable yard, with the least trotting close at his side. Unconscious of their approach, Borlo Bunnison slept on. Uncle and niece halted some ten feet from the blacksmith. For a few seconds they stood watching him, their heads cocked at identical angles, ears canted forward, greenish eyes alight. Then Uncle Quince commanded sharply, Wake up, fellow! Borlo Bunnison, away with you this instant! Elise could distinguish the words without difficulty, despite the overlay of wolfish growls. Barlow Bunnison's lids lifted. He beheld the two giant wolves, and at once he was fully awake. His eyes bulged, and his hands tightened on his sole weapon, the staff. For a few moments he sat paralyzed and staring. Then, very softly, he rose to his feet, and without turning his head, began to fumble at the iron latch on the door behind him. Stop that, Uncle Quinn's commanded. Leave it alone. Barlow heard only a blood cur blood curdling snarl which froze him where he stood. Uncle Quinn's head was down, his hackles up, his lips writhed back to expose yellowish fangs. The breathless moments passed while man and illusory beasts stood motionless, and then Unobtrusively, Borlo's fingers crept once more across the latch. Don't touch it, Elise exclaimed. I'll bite you, Borlo. She was startled, almost alarmed by the ferocity of her own growls. Go away. Get out of here now, you unspeakable pig. Go. As she howled her last syllable, flecks of foam sprayed her contorted muzzle. Good child. Uncle Quince muttered, first rate. Borlo could not have understood the words, but the sentiments communicated themselves. His shaking hand dropped from the latch, and the snarls ceased at once. Sinking back on their haunches, the two creatures regarded him expectantly. For a time, Borlo stayed where he was, long staff defensively poised. Nothing happened, and at last, very gradually, he began to sidle away. The wolves sat watching him go. Borlo's pace increased. Reaching the corner of the building, he ducked around the wall, turned tail, and fled for his life. 
Ha! yipped Elise. Look at him run. Very gratifying, my dear, but he will probably be back soon with reinforcements. We have little time to spare. Oh, you're right. Let's hurry. Bounding forward, Elise pawed and scratched at the stable's door without result. She nosed the latch, then gnawed uselessly, whining her frustration. Child, you are perhaps a trifle confused. Stretching forth his right forepaw, Uncle Quince effortlessly unfastened the latch and pulled the big door open. Once again, Elise thought Elise thought to glimpse a shadowy, transparent human hand briefly superimposed upon the lupine, upon the lupine appendage. In you go. Wait, she turned to face him. Change us both back, Uncle Quince. Otherwise, we'll scare the life out of Dreth, not to mention the horses. Ah, very considerate. Although the horses would not be deceived. Eyes narrowed to almost sleepy slits, the gray wolf spoke softly. The long hackles smoothed themselves, the ears twitched, and the twilight fur seemed to soften to fog before the animal faded completely from view. And there was Uncle Quince again, mild and amiable as ever. At the same time, Elise felt herself changing, inside and out. Her true physical being reassert, reasserted itself abruptly as air rushing in to fill a vacuum, and she found herself once more human, whole and healthy, the lighted lantern still clasped in one hand. Oh, said Elise, oh. Come, child, no time to lose. They slipped into the stable, closing the door behind them, and instantly Elise was enveloped in the rich odors of horse, hay, sweat, dung, leather, and saddle soap that always filled the place. Before her stretched the long cobbled aisle lined with stalls housing the Marquis Vauderaval's prized horse flesh. Many of the animals had awakened at the opening of the door, and a number of shapely heads now poked inquiringly out into the aisle. Elise's gaze jumped to the stall of her own pet mare, Hussy, but no starred chestnut face was visible now. Hussy still slept, her unseen presence betrayed by the occasional muffled, snuffling exhalation. Elise had never been in the stable at night before. The silence, the shadows, and the weak orange light of the single lantern glancing off wide equine eyes lent mystery to an otherwise familiar scene. Even Uncle Quince seemed somewhat affected, for his voice was bemused as he inquired, And where have they hidden the lad, my dear? Softly, Elise admonished in a whisper, some of the grooms sleep in the haymow above. This way, I think. Tiptoeing with exaggerated stealth, she led her uncle to the back of the building, whose rear wall was faced with storage bins, racks, and one stout windowless tack closet, firmly shut. Pulling the heavy bolt, she opened the door, and lantern light spilled in to illuminate the reclining occupant. A dismayed gasp escaped her. Dreff looked ghastly. His face, a dreadful mass of cuts and purple bruises, was streaked with sweat and dried blood. Both eyes had been blacked, and one was swollen nearly shut. Also swollen were his lips, puffed, split, and darked with caked blood. His nose had providentially escaped breakage, but it was unlikely that all his bones had fared so well. As he raised himself to a sitting position, he moved with evident pain. Bracing himself against the wall, he pressed one hand to his side. The other went up to shield his eyes against, against the orange dazzle of lamplight. Already? he muttered. Dreff, don't you know us? Elise whispered, terrified. Elise? he squinted against the light. Master Quince? Quite right, lad, replied Uncle Quince. We have come to deliver you. Such an adventure. The seigneur. Dreff, don't try to speak, 
Elise directed, breathing an inward sigh of relief. He was neither blind nor altogether dead, as she had initially feared. Here, drink this. She proffered the carafe of tea. He gulped it down, almost desperately. When the vessel was empty, she told him the worst. My father has ordered your mutilation in the morning. Typical. Be quiet. We are going to take you out of here right now, but we must hurry. The blacksmith and his louts may be back any moment. Can you stand? Anything broken? Borlo has cracked my Borlo has cracked my rib, I believe. Lean on me. He obeyed, and she helped him to his feet. He rose with a hiss of sharply indrawn breath to stand swaying and dizzy. Uncle Quince offered a supportive shoulder, and the three of them proceeded haltingly along the aisle under the inquisitive eyes of the horses, back to the exit and out, latching the stable door behind them. Once out of doors, Dreff's head cleared. He breathed deeply of the fresh night air, and his step steadied. They increased their pace then, bundling the fugitive around the carriage house and out across the fields within seconds. Elise cast a quick glance back over her shoulder. She saw no lights and heard no voices as yet, but surely Dreff's escape would be discovered long before morning. And what then? No doubt the affronted Marquis Vauderaval would order the erring bold Borlo Bunnison soundly whipped. So much the better. And what would happen, it occurred to her, for the first time to wonder, if the complicity of the seigneur's only daughter were to be discovered? Of course, she would be protected. Her unworthy, irresponsible disobedience would be carefully concealed in order to preserve her matrimonial marketability. But the Marquise would be furious, and she would surely feel the weight of his wrath. Would he go so far as to cancel her impending trip to Shireen, even to his own ultimate disadvantage? He might indeed be that angry. Beyond question, she would, sh- she would be severely punished if the Marquis Vauderaval found her out. He must never find out. She fought the urge to break into a run. Elise glanced briefly at her companions. Uncle Quince was a little winded and breathing hard, judging by his exhilarated expression. Its excitement seemed the likeliest cause. Dreff's shortened strides were uneven. He was limping slightly, and one hand remained pressed to his ribs. Facial bruises and swelling completely masked his expression, if any. Around them stretched the cultivated fields, plowed soft soil soft, plowed soil soft underfoot, vegetation neat and low, a broad moonlit expanse whose open sweep left them perilously exposed. But straight ahead rose the timber stand, its dense shadow offering temporary cover. They hastened across those last few yards at a pace approaching a run. Only when they had reached the inadequate shelter of trees did they dare to pause. Where shall we put him, Uncle Quince? Elise inquired as if weighing the face of a stray weighing the fate of a stray dog. Your house? For tonight at least? Certainly the lad is welcome, replied Uncle Quince. He may stay as long as necessary. Oh, that is perfect. They'll never find him there. Not if they search for months. She turned to the fugitive. Did you hear that, Dreff? Right now we're taking you to... No, said Dreff. I will leave Daraval tonight. Don't be absurd. You can't leave. You can barely walk. Tonight you'll go to Uncle Quince's cottage, rest and recover there. While you are mending, I'll persuade my father to pardon you, or at the very least to reduce your sentence, and then you'll return. If by chance I should fail with the seigneur, we'll reconsider your departure at some future date. Don't worry, I've money for you in this bag, should you actually need to go. There's food in there, too. But tonight you shall not consider... At least, stop, Dress, Dreff advised. His swollen lips formed words with some difficulty. It was obviously painful for him to speak, but his manner was equable, even a little amused. 
In the first place, I am quite capable of walking or running as required. In the second, your chances of, persu of persuading his lordship to reduce my sentence are virtually nil. If I'm to survive unmaimed, I must leave at once. I know that and you know it too. Otherwise, why, why would you have brought me food and money tonight? For which, by the way, I thank you. Removing his hand from his ribs with reluctance, Dreff reached out and slid the strap from her shoulder, taking possession of the canvas satchel. I gave you no leave to take that. I beg your pardon, miss. I thought you had brought it for me. Shall I return it? That impudent tongue you got that impudent tongue got you into this pickle. If you were one tenth as clever as you think you are, you'd have learned when to hold it. You madman, why did you speak that way to my father? What made you do it? Dreff considered. Pure spleen, he decided. Idiot, be serious for once. You cannot go. It is a foolish thought, impractical and, and illegal. You are a serf, legally bound to the Daravel soil. That's the law, and there are sound reasons for it. Sound indeed from the exalted viewpoint, but let us descend to more mundane considerations, Dreff suggested. By morning, the seigneur will raise all the countryside against me. My description will be posted in every tavern and market square in the district, and I'll never dare show my face. But if I run at once, tonight, the way is still comparatively clear and will continue so for some hours. It's the best chance I'm like to have. As I don't fancy vivisection, I plan to take it. But where would you go? What would you do? Go? Anywhere I please. There's an entire world waiting, Dreff replied, and now his listeners caught the leashed excitement vibrating beneath the cool exterior. Do? Again, exactly as I please. I am not without talent, and I'll find a way of putting it to good use at last. They say the new reasoning has heated Shireen to the boil these days. Perhaps I'll see that for myself. If I cut straight across the hills and walk all night, I might pick up the morning stage on the King's Highway. Lunacy, opined Elise, startled as if a supposedly broken-winged hawk had suddenly taken to the air. What about your cracked rib? I'll have it taped when I can. That is not satisfactory. You shall not go because, 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 because I do not wish it. <sighs> Little Ellie, his battered smile expressed amused affection. I'll miss you. Miss me? For the first time, she realized that he was truly going. And when he went, she would never see him again. The thought was remarkably disturbing, almost shocking. She could barely keep from grabbing his arm. No, wait, this is impossible. I order you to stay. You will resent my decision, but it is for your own good. He started to laugh, then winced and ceased abruptly, hand pressed tight to his ribs. Perhaps you shouldn't have unlocked that stable door, but your innate decency got the better of you this time. This time? And what is that supposed to mean? That I'm grateful for what you've done tonight. Dreff turned to Uncle Quince. And I thank you, sir. The two of you have truly given me my life. Ah, it has been a delightful excursion, lad. Would you care to take the lantern with you? No, sir, I'm better without. And now I'm off. At least, goodbye. I'll not forget you. Come, don't scowl like that. Will you shake hands? Shake hands with a serf. So taken by surprise was she that his unbelievable presumption went unreproved. Without thinking, she extended her hand, which he took in his own and pressed once. Thank you, little Ellie. Goodbye. He released her hand, which she now regarded with an air of amazement. Swiveling on his heel, he hurried away without a backward glance. Good luck, Dreff, she called after him. She could not tell whether he heard. 
For a couple of minutes, she watched as he made his way around the moonlit fish pond, circling wide to avoid the cottages on the far side. The dim light barely served to inform her that his strides were uneven but swift and his limp minimal. A moment later, he rounded the angle to the nearest cottage and his tall form vanished from sight. Elise turned to her uncle. He's gone, she observed stupidly. Indeed, dear child, our mission is accomplished. Are you not happy? I suppose so. In reality, she was feeling tremendously let down, almost desolate. When she had made her plans hours earlier, she had anticipated the triumph of Dreth's release from the stable. Her imagination, however, had not carried her on to the inevitable sequel, his permanent departure from Derival and from her life. Do you think he'll be all right? He's a resort. He's a resourceful lad. We may hope for the best. Yes. Well, I guess that's that. Excellent. And in celebration of our success, my dear, may I not prevail upon you to come back to my cottage for a glass of cider and a game of blue cat? Not tonight, Uncle Quince. It's very late. I'm awfully tired, and I'd better return to my room, my room before I'm missed. Another time, I promise. Whatever you think best, my dear. You do look tired and rather sad. You're not. Thank you for listening to Orion's Bedtime Stories podcast. We hope you've enjoyed it and that you have a lovely, relaxing evening. Thank you.